Very good afternoon to each of you. It is a great pleasure for the World Economic Forum to receive the delegation of the government of Cuba at this 10th World Economic Forum on Latin America. We have joining us today a distinguished panel made up of the Foreign Affairs Secretary of Mexico, the Minister of Finance and Prices of Cuba, the General Director of the Foreign, Inve uh, Foreign Investment for the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Foreign Investment of Cuba, and the Secretary of, the Econ of Economy of Mexico, Secretary Guajardo. Uh, again, we extend to you our best wishes to offer this global platform of the World Economic Forum to support the efforts underway by the government of Cuba in its process of economic um, modernization. We begin giving the floor to uh, Jose Antonio Mead, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is our pleasure to participate in this forum. It is not uh, a surprise to anyone uh, that Mexico and Cuba have shared for a long time a close relationship. When the government of President Peña Nieto began, we reviewed the framework in which this relationship uh, existed and the historic friendship and the ties joining our countries and how we could bring our two countries together. Um, we understood that the political framework uh, did not, in fact, reflect the closeness of, between our two countries. And in 2014, we reviewed and changed uh, the trade and the political, uh, the tourism, tourism promotion, the efforts at bilateral cooperation uh, and uh, cooperation jurisdictionally as well. Mexico is a strong supporter of the modernization efforts underway in Cuba. And we considered that Cuba's participation in this forum was uh, of great importance, hand in hand with the Secretariat of the Economy Pro Mexico opened uh, in 2014, 68 business leaders from Mexico uh, visit. I was forced to return due to an appendicitis. Uh, this became uh, almost a, a family event, but these 68 visitors uh, have resulted in 50 investment projects from Mexico, 19 of which are underway to date. The first project approved in the Mariel Special Economic Zone was a program from Mexico. Uh, four licenses have been issued for ferry operators, and the first one to a Mexican operator. This highlights the diplomatic space uh, and the close ties and affection between our countries. And this translates into links between our countries that will not only um, be those that exist today, but that opportunities for further cooperation are fertile. We thank you, uh, Ms. Argueta. We thank the World Economic Forum and especially those who join us today from Cuba, Deborah Rivas and Lina Pedraza, who will explain to us the opportunities that Cuba offers today. This is a, a real and concrete opportunity, which is translating into greater opportunities in Cuba and great opportunities for close relationships between Mexico and Cuba and Cuba and the Caribbean and Latin America as a whole. Thank you very much for joining us today in the beginning of this dialogue. Thank you very much, Mr. Foreign Secretary. Uh, I'll give the floor to Lina Pedraza, the Minister of Finance of Cuba. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Jose Antonio Culibreña and Alfonso Villarreal, uh, Marisol Argueta, and distinguished participants, we, above all, want to thank you for the warm welcome that we have received and for the opportunity to share with you the uh, issues uh, and the current situation. We want you to become familiar with the economic model and to explain to you in general terms what are the next steps that Cuba is ta has taken and is undertaking in the area of foreign investment particularly and in the business opportunities that this represents. We 
uh, taken concrete steps, and that's why the delegation that is joining us here, uh, to which the ambassador of Cuba in Mexico is also joining. Cuba has made great steps forward, despite the difficulties that all of the countries in the world face in terms of uh, economic challenges, climate change, uh, the blockade, the harsh blockade that has affected us, but which in this last decade has also meant a recovery and a shift towards development. This is what has uh, really been marking the stages of economic development. Our macroeconomic indicators in Cuba show a relative stabilization and a reduction of public deficit in inflation rates that are acceptable. We have tried to contain the threats of hyperinflation that have affected our uh, people. Uh, we have tried to maintain a trade in uh, trade surplus in goods and services. We have worked very hard to achieve this. We have also reconstituted our foreign trade efforts and have made uh, medical services, the sale of biotechnology products as areas of priority. And in each of these areas, this has allow us, allowed us to uh, no longer be a monoculture export-driven country, but to a producer of services that are of high added value. We are committing, we are committed and we are meeting our financial commitments. We are financing the foreign debt of Cuba from decades ago that has been renegotiated and we have yet uh, a group uh, from the Club of Paris that is working in an ad hoc manner and we anticipate good results from that. All of this create the conditions for greater stability and development of our economy. Faced with this scenario, from the year 2011 to date, uh, there have been uh, efforts and a political decision to update and modernize Cuba's economy. What does this updating or modernization of the Cuba of the Cuban economy mean? Some have called it reform. Others have called it a restructured restructuring. restructuring. Uh, why? Do we in Cuba call this an updating in the social model? This is based on a diagnosis of the situation that we were living in. We identified 313 areas in which we would be working uh, in terms of policies that we would be following, different sectoral and social programs that would allow our country to progress in the short term and also set forth priorities for the midterm and the long term in such a way that we could sustain our socialist economy and to support over time the achievements of our socialist economy to protect uh, the assets of the state uh, in the area of production, the basic strategic and production assets, and that other, other um, assets could be developed by other social actors and economic actors, so that property essentially remain in the hands of the state. We consider that this is the essence of why we are adapting or changing our model. The social aspects, the social character, and the social development is a priority for this model. Other elements that we uh, considered needed to be uh, kept are central planning. Planning allows us to see the future that we wish to achieve. We need um, an important uh, number of years. This isn't something that we expect to achieve in the short order. We need to be able to project very seriously and to know where we are headed. 
we are working uh, to deliver results to all those willing to work towards uh, the creation of cooperatives. More than 500 non-agricultural cooperatives have been set up in different service sectors, uh, personal services, uh, automotive workshops, small cooperatives that work in the area of construction. All of these have been uh, set up, have been approved so that the state is no longer involved in administering those areas that are not considered essential strategic aspects of our economy. The state apparatus is thus uh, more streamlined and is able to concentrate on uh, key policies and a business uh, environment is concentrated in large-scale corporations, if you will, that using uh, financial indicators and uh, fulfilling the mission assigned to it by the state will play this business role. This is the way in which we are working. That was the... Uh, these were the four-year plans that we began planning an important number of public policies. Year by year, we consider uh, what measures are necessary to achieve these goals. I'll tell you what the 10 fundamental ones are in our planning strategy based on uh, the equilibrium that has to exist between external funding in the supply of food in order to ensure uh, basic food availability. Uh, many businessmen have asked me uh, what steps need to be taken. Many other countries uh, need to take steps. We pay a great deal for the import of food and we need to improve in this area. We need to work year by year and include in our planning uh, energy considerations so that this will allow us also over the future to assign uh, different resources to our energy network, which today uh, consumes a considerable percentage of fossil fuels. And we need to transform this towards the production of renewable energy. We also have uh, uh, improvements that are necessary in the area of cargo and passenger transportation in the next five-year plan. We are also working in uh, the course of this year to ensure a capacity for construction that would be responsive to the investment programs that will be approved. We also uh, will be responsive to projects that have been approved. Uh, we don't want to to be halfway uh, undertaken or paralyzed. We're also progressing in the capacity for circulation of wholesale as well as retail sales in terms of our workforce. Also, we include an analysis by the different territories in our country in order to facilitate employment so that the most important and strategic centers are uh, and considering the educational levels available in our country. And finally, uh, at the end of a year, the state budget also, which includes the various areas in which we have to ensure stability, a adequate monetary planning uh, as, ne as needed. We can recognize that we have made progress in two important areas. Firstly, in the calculations and estimates needed for the annual plans are estimates for based on the 2016-2020 uh, five-year plan, which is the most important priority for us because this will allow us to undertake rapid changes to structural pro programs, whether this involves national companies or foreign investment or the participation in the way uh, that we envision it with foreign investment. We're also working very diligently and we have made it a priority over the last four years to propose and present the strategy 
to eliminate this dual currency system that exists still in our country. Our uh, population is aware of this. We have announced it, and we expect that at a given date we will commence a process that will be, of course, implemented gradually over time because uh, this measure uh, was approved by our National Assembly, but uh, it was done, done so um, in order to guarantee that this wouldn't affect the uh, level, uh, and you can understand the complexity and how this would affect our uh, Cuban population. We need to do all of these steps in such a way as to protect, protect the social gains and the social protection efforts uh, and access, universal access to health care, to culture, to education, um, to housing. All of this is our way of safeguarding uh, access to sports as well, uh, the care for the elderly, for children. This has constantly been a priority for us. And this is part of that uh, updating of our social and economic model. This isn't a purely economic scheme that will leave aside social um, characteristics. The Cuban Revolution will continue to protect those achievements which it uh, can be proud of. I now am available to any further clarification to answer questions that you might have. Um, the President of the United States recently recognized uh, the uh, failure of that country's policies towards the Republic of Cuba. You are aware that very recently both presidents declared that they would initiate a dialogue to reestablish full diplomatic relations. And uh, steps have been taken and issues have been uh, discussed. This has a, a slower rhythm, if you will, uh, slower than most of us would like because of the need for um, U.S. companies to be able to operate in Cuba. Cuba needs this to happen. And our, countries, our country sees very positively the promise that all of this suggests. Now the challenge is to make this a reality. There are many differences uh, that exist. We... Uh, as a priority, need to see the elimination of the trade blockade that restricts us even today from being able to use the U.S. dollar in any transaction. You are aware of the enormous fines that have been levied against countries who have been uh, engaged in trade with Cuba. We... Uh, also, we're taking steps to continue to encourage U.S. businesses. We have been able to engage in dialogue, and such as this one. What can we do, they ask us. Your proposals are interesting and attractive to us. We need you to be participating in those um, food production uh, efforts that you have described. You need to become familiar with Cuban legislation. We have made available to them. Uh, try to be influential in your own country and uh, do everything you can because for us, this is very important. It's important for you as a business and it's important for us as a country also. And on a case-by-case -case basis, we see a slow approval. Uh, imagine yesterday there was the approval for a, a company operating a ferry. We might say, as uh, Dr. Alicia Barcenas recently said in a visit to Cuba and gave a wonderful uh, speech, she said, I have confirmed and what I see is that everything is intact. What I can tell you is that we are on the way, we are on the path of uh, seeing the adoption of measures by the government of the United States uh, that the president has the authority to undertake and that need to be approved by Congress, those areas that under are under uh, the jurisdiction of Congress. You can help us uh, explain the situation for Cuba. 
the request has already been made for Cuba to be excluded from the state sponsors of terrorism list, a list that we should have never been a part of. I also want to say that Gafisur has uh, withdrawn its monitoring of Cuba because it was able to confirm that in our territory, after a review of the documentation, that uh, all the barriers are in place to restrict uh, money laundering operations in our country and in our territory. These are steps that create a very positive environment, a favorable environment for trade, for investment in Cuba. And I'm talking here about the opportunities for U.S. Uh, business investors, but we're talking as well uh, to many Latin American business concerns uh, of what the strong points are, what the advantages are to investing in Cuba. This relaunching, if you will, of Cuba in the heart of the Latin American community. We're very satisfied uh, to hear and to learn of the many intentions and the many efforts to collaborate with Cuba. Many Mexican businessmen with whom we have been in dialogue. We also have uh, been supported by the CELAC organization, bringing together 33 countries of the Latin America Latin American region uh, that uh, also work towards a policy of complementarity. I also want to express the kindness and uh, the affection that you have shown us and the respect you have shown to our country. Many thanks to each of you. And uh, I give the floor back to our moderator. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much for such a wonderful and complete uh, presentation. Thank you for sharing this with the audience of the World Economic Forum. And now I'd like to give the floor to our guest, uh, uh, Deborah Rivas, also from Cuba, who's the De General Director for Foreign Investment of the Ministry of uh, Foreign Trade and Foreign Investment of Cuba. And we had a very interesting meeting, a very pleasant meeting recently with her in La Habana. And I would repeat, it's a pleasure and honor to have you amongst us. Deborah, you have the floor. Thank you, Marisol. We wanted to, to basically refer to the public policy that, as part of this updating of the economic model, it complements the system of policies being approved by the country to achieve a sustainable and prosperous economic development for all Cubans. And in particular, the policy approved in 2013, at the end of the year, that refers to foreign investment. Cuba already had a foreign investment law that dated to 1995. And with this new policy, we have wanted to make the policy transparent and legally, to provide legal certainty to investors in Cuba. So we've taken a group of steps to be able to create first a, an environment of confidence for foreign investors. The minister was referring to the renewal of our foreign debt. And that's one of the first things that, of course, when you uh, evaluate country risk that you're going to look at, or that any investor will look at. So what we did was to take the step of creating a policy that is published so that there's no doubt uh, in terms of what we're interested in doing and what sectors we want foreign investors to, to participate with us. And we also wanted to to uh, announce the creation of a special industrial zone, which is Mariel, which is 75 kilometers from La Habana, and it's open to the entire world. There's institutional framework. It has its own regulatory framework with a s set of incentives. The, Dr. Barcenas was telling us the other day that it wasn't... Uh, of Latin America to get involved in a war of incentives. And it's not about that. It is rather about working on the fundamental objective of having GDP of Cuba grow and at the end of, day, of the day to have uh, the training, or rather capital in Cuba to reach over 20% so as to be able to make that 
development leap required by the country. So in that sense, development does not distinguish amongst investors and within law 113, which is part of the Cuban uh, tax system. In other words, it's very transparent for foreign investors that there will be fiscal incentives. However, for what amount of time and to what extent and, and when will those ex incentives exist So, for the implementation of their investment so that it can have an effect on the economic development of the country. There are also a series of provisions that are very important in that law for foreign investors. And law 118, which is from 2014, which is the new foreign investment law. It's a law which is the regulatory framework for the special Mariel Zone area. We are promoting investment in 11 sectors. The minister was telling us about production of food in Cuba. Our bill for food is in, in excess of $2 billion annually. So the agri-food business, in which the first user of the area is an American company that's going to produce food, and that it is vital for us. And then we talk about development of the entire industry. There's technology uh, obsolescence in the country, and we have to update our technology. We're talking about the electronic industry, the the light industry, as well as the transportation, construction industries. And there are advantages that Cuba, uh, comparative advantages of Cuba for investment, which is development of biotechnology, for instance. Today in this foreign investment policy, for the first time we're inviting foreign investment into that sector. We've also opened the health sector op up. And in this sector, Cuba is a leader in the region. We've also opened the wholesale trade sector, and it was not open previously in under our previous foreign investment law. So there are 11 sectors, including the tourism sector, that has an important weight because of its growth and the growth that we've seen in terms of the number of tourists who come to the country. Also in the change of the of energy sector, there are many renewable energy projects that are gaining a great deal of interest for foreign investment. So we're talking about foreign investment that has rules that are well established, that are clear, that are institutionalized through standards, and that also have the support through public policy of the country's authorities. In other words, there will always be a first space to create a climate of confidence so that people can understand how the regulatory framework works and then progressively we'll be bringing in new projects and new businesses fostered by foreign capital. We wanted to say that with on the web page of this of, of the WEF there there will be a portfolio of opportunities available so that includes a total of 246 investment projects in all of these sectors that I've been telling you about. And they can be useful. It can be useful. You've got the contact data as well on the website and the public policy. And also on a sectoral basis, you can look at the economic indicators that we have today in each of these sectors. And you also have contact information so that you can follow up on any point of interest so that uh, we can answer any question question that you might have. We're very, very appreciative of uh, any questions and any interest that you might have in our projects. We'd like to see greater exchange on any of these topics. Thank you very much. Deborah, thank you. In effect, indeed. There is information available to all of you with the identification of, of the portfolios for uh, investment in the projects, as well as information in terms of the regulatory framework for foreign investment in Cuba. There's also this information will be on our web page on Toplink, that, and all of you will be able to use it within the is based of knowledge on Latin America. I'd like to invite all of you to pose your questions of the Cuban delegation. You can do that through by addressing your questions to their mobile phones or to 
wef dot ch dash a s w b ask it ch dash ask a s k you all have a piece of paper on your chairs and on those pieces of paper you'll see the URL so that you can find it. Uh, you can have a greater ease to find it. I would like to thank, to give the floor to Secretary Idelfonso Guajardo, the Secretary of Economy of Mexico, to take the floor uh, to address us. And after that, we'll be pleased to take your questions. Marisol, thank you so much. I'd like to begin by recalling something that happened about 30 years ago. Many of you know Ángel Gurria. He wa is the current uh, secretary, uh, secretary General of the OECD in Paris, but at that time he was the governor of the bank, Central Bank of Mexico. And he had a difficult experience to go through at that time. There was a Mexican company that invested in Cuba, and Central Bank of Mexico had a debt of $300 million. And Angel was created by a family. His mother was Fidel Castro's number one fan. So she adored him. So Angel went to Cuba to try and collect on the debt. And he had a great meeting with Presidente Castro. And then he spoke, he called his mother and he said, guess where I am? And she, and she said, where? And he said, I'm in Cuba, and I've come to collect co the commander's debt. And she said, bueno, creo que 30 años después de la mamá de Gurria te The better. And it was, at the end of the day, that debt that, that intervened in the standardization of the economic uh, relations and this situation changed with the arrival of this current administration where there was a re mutual recognition that led us to in-depth negotiation that had led us uh, in turn to change the relationship. Our economic agreement was signed for the first time in I don't know how many years, in 14 years, and it changed 60% of our trade relations because we were able to reach a 375, 75, 575, 375 rather billion dollars in a relationship. And it was President Peña who instructed his economy team to begin the renegotiation of AC 51, where, which we concluded in November 2013 where we renegotiated 3,600 tariff fractions and we incorporated new, one, new ones and broadened those that were existing. And this required a great deal of attention from the government, but most importantly, I was able to head up the first Mexican mission with 60 Mexican entre entrepreneurs to Cuba in 2014, in May of 2014, many of you who were there, including Angelica, and on the basis as of that mission, as a result of that trip, 15 prospective investment projects came about. And the most important point is that Mexico took the decision to open the Pro-Mexico office headed up by Francisco Gonzalez. And as based on that, we've had in-depth interaction with our in our relationship with Cuba. Undoubtedly, the actions taken by the Cuban government in terms of its new strategic uh, trade zone, this opens essential areas of trade for Mexico. And Mexican uh, investments are very enthusiastic about retaking up a historical relationship. And it was just it, mistaken actions that distanced us in our relationship with Cuba. I was talking to my counterpart about this, in, in the, my Cuban uh, counterpart, and Minister Mister Minierta has made it a very important uh, statement in terms of that. He, he estimates that Cuba needs $2.5 billion in investment 
And that was what was required before the NAFTA. And I think it's strategic for Latin American investments to take a look at regional opportunities. Now is the time to pay attention to events in Cuba so as to reestablish Latin American integration as it should always have been. It was a great pleasure for us to have uh, been able to accompany the President of Mexico to the Summit of the Americas, where Cuba's presence was truly historic and memorable. We congratulate you for your presentations, and I would say, I say that we should move on to questions from the audience. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We have several questions, and we will begin with the first question that, and I'm going to translate for you. How can Cuba, in the process of opening itself, have an impact on tourism in Latin America? Right. The essence of tourism and Cuba's tourist tourism development is uh, the following. We could talk about Latin America, but I'll give you the concrete example of what we've referred to today with the Secretary of Tourism of Mexico. Our country experiences tourism as a tourism of a supplementary type of tourism. It's an island that participates within an archip archipelago of different islands, and Cuba has never seen its uh, tourism as a tourism that could affect the tourism of those small uh, island states that live from tourism. And uh, from a continental standpoint, it can't affect, for instance, Mexican tourism, but we've spoken of acting jointly with integrated programs between Mexico and Cuba and other destinations, working from the standpoint of multiple dest tourism des destinations. For many years, we have worked on developing this, particularly so as to avoid effect impacting the uh, island states that are close to Mexico. And clearly, the prices have to be comparable to those of other packages that are sold outside of the country, because the packages are, are bought in the places of origin, and people who are going to buy the, the travel packages are going to compare between this and that and the other, this beach or that or the other. And that's part of the analysis. I think the important point is that you take into account that we don't believe that there's a huge competition in terms of the tourism development versus other areas. And with Mexico, there's a huge possibility because of the solidity this of the tourism sector in Mexico. And of course, we share a, a common area. So we could have a mutually advantageous uh, organ, uh, plans and organizations. And I think that business persons would be well advised to take a look at this. Uh, we agreed, and there will soon be contacts from business persons visiting the country. This has already begun. There's been initial contacts, and these types of conversations have already uh, been undertaken, and we're going to be working hard on this. And that's the example of Mexico. Their question referred to all of Latin America. Well, I can say that Cuba is open to all of Latin America. We, what we need is to properly develop the tour operators that are specialized in Latin America. We want them to come in and work with Cuban destinations. And in this sense, we have to continue to work hard and to call upon the entrepreneurs to study these possibilities because it, Cuban tourism isn't just the sun and beaches, but it's also the cultural activities and the capital of the country uh, in La Habana. There, and there are other cities like Santiago de Cuba. And for several reasons that tourists who come to Cuba want to go to different cities and not just to go to uh, the beaches to enjoy the sun. 
There's an important program for de continuing to develop tourism in the country. We have to continue to grow in that sense because uh, period of time uh, we will see a tourism uh, growth of tourism and we're going to see it all over Latin America and uh, because we're going to see a flood of incoming tourism at the end of the day because there were many people couldn't come to Cuba directly they had to go to other countries first to be able to come to Cuba but now this is going to change. People are going to be able to come directly to the country. So that's going to change. With Latin America, we can work a great deal. And we have a program that's foreseen for development of tourism investors that's quite broad-based. And it seems to us that we are just getting started so as to be able to place Cuba's tourism sector where it should be. There are several projects in this portfolio of opportunities that we've put together. You'll <coughs> see locations, maps, where there's a micro-localization of all of the areas that are up for investment. We've worked significantly on this, and one of our priorities is indeed the tourism sector. There's work to be done, of course, and we trust that Latin American entrepreneurs will be motivated to be part of this new drive that's required by uh, Cuba in the tourism sector. We have other questions for you. I'm going to translate again. When can we begin to see a Cuba that is open to investment from the United States? Well, is the answer from Ms. Pedraza? This could be a very long answer, but I'm going to answer it very quickly. Cuba is open. Cuba has never been closed. Cuba has always been open. Cuba has nothing against, nor has it ever had anything against the people of the United States nor does the people of the United States have anything against the people of Cuba. Mothers of Cuban citizens are mothers of uh, U.S. citizens, and in this sense, this enables uh, entrepreneurs from the United States to invest, and the standards are the same as for all countries in the world. There is no specific standard or set of regulations for investments for in investors from the United States versus those from anywhere else in the world. In the U.S., they need to move forward on the processes that they've referred to, that they've talked about. They have to work on that, but that is the reality. It's not something that depends on, that, that Cuba has to work on. It's rather something that has to be done elsewhere. Thank you, Madam Mist Minister. Another question for you, and it says, once again, I'm going to translate, how can the foreign private sector invest without having ownership of its assets? Well, I'm going to send this question for help on detailed, uh, for details to Deborah Rivas, because sometimes there are things that become myths. So let's go from myths to reality, Deborah. First of all, I would say that we have to say something that's quite simple. The Cuban Constitution respects, and one of its articles says so, it respects property, state property, as well as mixed companies and associations. In other words, const constitutionally, first of all, there's a respect for property, of domestic and foreign investors. And then the foreign investment law also allows investors to set up businesses in Cuba and for them to be owners of all of the assets that are produced in the country. Once 
the and the state has n is not empowered to act upon those assets that are created by that foreign investment and the law actually says that those assets cannot be expropriated and it is the capacity of those businesses established in Cuba to generate the assets that they can they must be established in their financial statements of course but it is the shareholders or the owners of those assets that can act upon them. There are assets, Cuban assets, that are the property of the state that are not, whose ownership is not transferred to foreign investors. The case, for instance, of the land. If there is a business in agriculture that we would like to undertake, then the Cuban state transfers a right, a real property right, the use and enjoyment of the land, of the surface land, and this is allowed by our civil code, and that right is an intangible asset of the business so that the project can be developed for a period of up to 99 years, and that's the amount of time that is allowed according to the civil code, and, these, and the foreign investor can use that land uh, for agricultural purposes. If it's a real estate development, then the foreign investment law states that all real estate, property, housing, etc., that is built on the right of the surface land has a, a ownership in perpetuity so that those houses can, the ownership of those ha houses it can be held by foreign investors. So there is no problem in the country for foreign investors in terms of the ownership of land, those who have to, liqu to liquidate or to sell their businesses, then the law guarantees that there's a repatriation of uh, whatever belongs to the foreign investors. So there is no difficulty in terms of any type of investment. Same applies to tourism development, agriculture, or any type of project that uh, requires the granting of a for it that business or use of the assets. Marisol, was my answer clear? Yes, I believe, Deborah, that your question, your answer was very clear and complete. Another question that I have for you. Could you explain, it says, the role of foreign investors in the modernization of the technological pattern, uh, of Cuba's technological pattern, or model, if you will? Foreign investors are absolutely required for changing the technology model that we have in Cuba right now. This is one of the most important reasons, as the secretary was explaining, that is precisely it. That's what we seek. We seek to modernize our industry, to modernize and update our industry. What's happening in Cuba today is that there is insufficient liquidity to meet the modernization process required by the technology today. And on the, and on the, other, and on the other hand, we require uh, uh, accelerated implementation for modernization because of the demographic structure of our country. We are a, a population with a, a, a low level of um, birth, a low birth rate, and we are only 11 million people. Uh, that demographic situation is very difficult to change, and we require uh, rapid um, efforts at using the most um, modern technology for automatization and uh, the modernization of all of Cuba's society. This is absolutely key. We'll only be able to do this with foreign investment. Necessary. We have clearly uh, calculated this and planning. We will not be able to achieve this with international credits. And uh, we wouldn't be able to grow quickly enough to repay those debts. We can't build quickly enough to uh, grow in order to repay those credits. So we need farm investment. We need technology. We need 
uh, the access to the market if that foreign investor expects to export uh, their production. We also need to uh, keep in mind the scales. We are only 11 million consumers. So in terms of the economy of scale, an important uh, angle of this will be producing in Cuba, but to export to the entire Caribbean region or elsewhere. So this is absolutely necessary. We have more questions. I think we'll have maybe time for one or two more. Here's another question. Is there a date uh, predicted for a currency unification? A lot of steps have already been taken, but we do not have an expected date. We have not determined what the date will be. We're not working on the expectation of a uh, given fixed date. We have been dismantling everything that uh, went along with working with uh, the two system currency. Uh, the national currency, uh, the other currency that was created, the CEC, which has a exchange rate of 25 to 1 in uh, individual relationships. That currency will be eliminated. Uh, the people of Cuba are aware of this, and uh, Cuba's population must not be affected in any way by these changes. But we have not announced any given date as such, because it requires very careful and complete planning to avoid uh, ill effects to our economy and to our population. Maybe we have time for one more question. Thank you, Madam Minister. I'm going to translate. What are the other sectors attractive for foreign investment? Uh, maybe sectors that wouldn't be so obvious, such as tourism. All right, I'll give the floor to Deborah for this. The law on foreign investment does not restrict investment to any uh, sector except for health, education, and armed forces. So there are no limitations for foreign investment. We have uh, spoken of 11 different sectors because these are the sectors that we are prioritizing to attract. This has to do with industrial, uh, sectors in general, transportation, renewable energies, biotechnology, the health sector, but there are no limitations really. In fact, the portfolio of opportunity of opportunities that we uh, have expected is not considered to be a straitjacket either. Uh, opportunities, if there are interests uh, that a investor could consider, we'll evaluate it. There's an open possibility of investing in our national economy without restrictions legally uh, for uh, our region's investors and entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs from uh, other areas of the world. Thank you, Deborah. We have been fascinated and enriched by the information you've shared with us. I think uh, Many have found this interesting. We appreciate very much. And I hope this is one of many opportunities that we have. We uh, are, as ever, uh, willing and able to collaborate with this effort. We'll share with you, as I said, this information on our uplink page. And the ministers will remain with us throughout the rest of today, as well as tomorrow, if you wish to make individual appointments. And if there uh, are other uh, areas in which we can collaborate, we are willing to do so. There's uh, available material for any persons who are interested. Please collect the published uh, printed information. Uh, the dinner offered by the President of Mexico is in the Zen Garden at 8.30 in the evening, where we expect to see you. Thank you once again. Thank you to the delegation of Cuba.